Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us for yet another exhilarating panel. Uh, this panel will deal with the question of funding the future, how African philanthropy is shaping a new landscape of cultural discourse. Uh, the presenters here will discuss how the development of not-for-profit organizations and philanthropic endeavors, as well as hybrid funding structures in many African countries is providing a new space for aesthetic exploration, artistic experimentation, and community engagement. It will include uh, Tessa Bahana, director of 32 Degrees East, um, and Uganda Arts Trust Kampala. Mamou Defe, chairperson of the Africa Cultural Fund, ACF, based in Bamako, Mali. Josh Ginsberg, director of A4 Arts Foundation in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, Bruno Leteo, co-director of Hangar Center for Artistic Research and head curator of FAS in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, uh, and Damian Nixon, uh, art tactic, of Art Tactic, um, editor of Africa, Art and Philanthropy in 2019. Um, and this uh, panel was produced in collaboration with Art Tactic. If you could give the panelists a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Actually, I might stand up just to introduce. Uh, thank you very much for um, skipping lunch to join us for this discussion. Um, either that or you're skipping Simon Jami's next panel, which is very flattering for us, I think. Um, so over the past several months, uh, I've been um, working on a collaboration with Art Tactic, which is a leading global market research firm, uh, to produce uh, a major survey and study of non-profit non and private philanthropic initiatives across Africa. Uh, certainly the cultural infrastructure in many African states remains undernourished, uh, which leaves artists with few opportunities for career development or recognition, uh, except for often the international market or international institutions. Uh, but that landscape on the continent is changing. Um, we've discovered uh, a very rapid transformation, particularly in the last five to 10 years, uh, driven by individuals and groups and organizations uh, developing everything from uh, large private museums and foundations to project spaces and exhibition venues uh, to residency programs uh, and, and art schools. Uh, we will be publishing uh, the first edition of Africa Art and Philanthropy in the autumn which, as Josh pointed out, I should uh, make sure the South Africans in the room uh, realize that autumn is October. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, the intention of the report uh, was to, oh, excuse me, um, the intention of the report was to showcase the range of initiatives uh, that are being developed across the continent, to highlight trends and discuss the challenges. Uh, and we hope through publishing this uh, analysis uh, to spark a debate, uh, to expose the gaps that need to be filled in the cultural ecology, uh, and also to inspire emerging philanthropists to keep developing new models uh, for, for the development of the cultural scene. Uh, please engage with us in this research, which we launch today. Um, uh, and uh, over the next few months, we hope to hear from anyone who is working on a project we've not yet profiled or engaged with. Um, we, we definitely can only do this research with your help. Um, we have some preliminary findings, and uh, there is a, is a, uh, a handout on your, uh, uh, on your seats, uh, and you'll also see some of that data rolling through the slideshow as a backdrop while we have our conversation today. Um, but to give you a few kind of highlights, uh, we, we found a, a very large number of projects, uh, as I say, being developed over the, and launched over the last 10 years across the continent, uh, particularly driven, which is encouraging by private initiatives, those funded by private individuals or foundations. Um, what was extraordinary actually was that about 50% of those private initiatives even uh, were artist-led. And we, we were in a, a fabulous session yesterday with Ibrahim Mahama, who's uh, a very inspiring project. A lot of artists 
uh, who have found success um, internationally or, or, or at home uh, are, are investing in their own artistic communities and building infrastructure and building schools and building projects, uh, which is completely going to transform the landscape for the next generation of, of talent. Um, we found that the opportunities at home in the last five to ten years are increasing. Um, an extraordinary new number of residency programs um, across the continent. I think uh, there, are, there are about 24 residency programs that we've so far discovered, um, uh, and only six of them were existing in 2007. Um, in, uh, also in exhibition and project spaces, so non-commercial venues for artists to show work and experiment and innovate, and also the number of festivals. Uh, again, so far at this stage in the research, we found 14 festivals, public art festivals and biennials across the continent that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, on the other hand, we also discovered um, that there remains a huge reliance on international funding. Uh, the international government agencies particularly have been incredibly supportive. Um, the Goethe Institute, the Alliance Francaise, the British Council, Mimeta, etc. Um, uh, and, and also international grant giving foundations. Um, we found that uh, there was a surprisingly little amount of corporate support for the arts uh, beyond um, some minimal sponsorship for events. Uh, and we found that there was a little bit of a mismatch in terms of regions. Um, uh, East Africa particularly seemed to be lagging in the number of projects, not, not of course the quality of projects, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the number of projects, um, which was, pot pot was perhaps a surprise uh, given you know, the economic strength and growth in places like Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, so, to help us unpack uh, some of these issues and, uh, uh, and, and discuss the, the current state of art and philanthropy across the continent. We have four fabulous panelists that have come to us. Well, four. <laughs> There's a ghost, but uh, Bruno is on the way from the airport, so that's Venice. Um, <laughs> so, so far, three from different corners of the continent. So we're really, really grateful that you've all traveled all of this way to discuss with us. Um, so, in no particular order, Mamou Dafe is the chairman of the African Culture Fund, which is a new grant-giving body that has been established. Uh, uh, it was the, it's the brainchild of a group of prominent artists. Um, and uh, actually, you're, you're right, Mamou. I should, I should do this. <laughs> uh, it's the brainchild of um, a group of prominent artists, uh, and seeks to provide. Um, African funding for African cultural projects. They just had their first uh, call uh, and have issued their first set of grants. Um, and uh, I'm sure Mama will tell you more about that. Uh, Tessa Bahana is the director of 32 Degrees East, the Ugandan Arts Trust, which is really the, the only contemporary art hub um, in a country that has a number of, of fabulous festivals. but but really is the only center for contemporary art in Kampala. Um, and Josh Ginsberg, who is the director of A4 Arts Foundation, um, which is uh, another newish project um, in Cape Town, uh, which is a contemporary art project space and lab, um, and uh, has been funded by the indomitable Wendy Fisher. So we have very different scenarios here, actually. Um, uh, a, a project that's been established by a renowned philanthropist, an independent nonprofit uh, in, in East Africa that has to seek funding from donors um, and a grant giving body, um, but as also an artist led project itself. Um, I think that we're going to have a great discussion. So, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, Uh, so, well, we might just start then by um, introducing our, our projects, actually, if that's great. So you can tell the audience in your own words um, the context in which you set up each of your individual projects and, and, uh, and, and what you seek to achieve. Maybe Josh go first. Okay, good evening, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, so A4S Foundation is a free-to-public, not-for-profit arts laboratory. 
laboratory in our case has sort of two prongs. On the one hand, it's to invite artists, curators, and cultural producers opportunity to test ideas, take chances, be ambitious. Uh, so that's the one sort of component of that experimental sort of stream. The other is to ask what exactly art does do in the, the greater society. What impact does it have? How do we measure it? What are the different languages we can devise around that so we can understand and justify the flow of resources into the ecology to grow it healthily? So those are the two streams of experimentation, artists and the role of art itself. Um, as Damien pointed out, the, the project came together through uh, the, the like incredible generosity and spirit and energy of Wendy who's here and my and her relationship over the last seven or eight years. Um, the intention was relatively simple. It was a function of acknowledging the, the lack of public resources or resources for the arts in the public domain, the fact that the, um, the sort of ecology in South Africa is bookended pretty radically by the commercial sector on the one hand that has a, a great reach and impact, and on the other hand by the universities, those two limits set up spaces that are pretty intimidating and alienating for those that don't have the language to participate or the money to participate. And as we all know, the arts intentionally is in the public domain where you can catalyze innovation of various formats. So the idea with A4 was to try and understand how we could participate with other organizations, funding bodies, artists and other, to stimulate that ecology and figure out where the balances need be or how to reformat it. Um, and that's, that's our role. Our role is, is again, to encourage various um, experiments, but also to weave together the network in, in the best possible way, which includes principally how to get resources to flow into the ecology both in South, Southern Africa and further afield. And so in, and in South Africa, actually, the, the ecosystem is relatively developed um, in comparison with some of your neighbors, certainly. Um, so in term, when, you, when you were establishing A4, how did you have to think about um, where you fit into that ecosystem sure. and uh, obviously there are a couple of very high profile um, private collections that have now been open to the public and, and in, in museums and, and this kind of thing. So how did you have to think about how you slotted into that? Sure. Okay, well the first part of that is to leverage what exists, right? And one of those factors is a very strong marketplace. And without a, a critical infrastructure in the public domain, that marketplace has the capacity to run amok. It can, you know, money can determine history and that's obviously unsettling. But on the other hand, there are people who are spending money buying artworks who are curious, they want to participate, and part of our role, come, come sit. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Uh, so point one on that is to understand that infrastructure and that yeah. ecology and figure out how those resources can be made more alert to the needs that, they, that the greater ecosystem has. So that is a conversion from or a kind of transformation from collector to patron. So collecting is a practice and I think that's something we're, we're very invested in which is encouraging good collecting practices and patronage is a practice. Of course they can overlap um, but they are also useful to understand them as distinct things. So that's part of it is understanding that part of the ecology and working in the other direction and the same could be said from the academies. Sophisticated and organized uh, but how are those ideas entering into the public domain and what role can they play in performing that? And then you thicken out the middle by, by welcoming people into those spaces. And I suppose that's a coordinate of A4 is given those limits, there's a huge amount of, like I said, alienation, intimidation. What can we do to allow people into a space where it's not necessary to understand everything you see? It's okay to be uncertain. It's okay to sort of ask big questions and, and so on. And that thickens out a, ideally a, a public space that can then sort of grow together. Terrific. And I, I want to talk later about, about how you, um, you measure impact and, 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 and that kind of thing, but that's great. Um, so I should just introduce Bruno, who, uh, <laughs> who has literally flown in for this panel <laughs> and arrived an, an hour ago. So Bruno is the co-director at, uh, at the Hangar in, uh, in, in Lisbon. Um, and also the, the uh, head curator of um, FAS, which is uh, a new a collection of African art. Um, uh, again, when we get round, you will explain um, in your own words, but, but thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, Tessa. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm here from 32 degrees east, Ugandan Arts Trust. Um, we're based in the capital of Uganda in Kampala, and we, as Damien said, are the only 
contemporary art space dedicated to the creation and exploration of contemporary arts in Uganda. Um, so I'd say not just in Kampala, but we're the only center of our kind in Uganda as a whole. Um, and I guess because we operate in a country that doesn't have a ministry of culture, um, visual arts is under the ministry of gender and social development. Um, and I think we have like two lines in the, in the policy. And so um, as a center, we sort of have to exist to uh, create a lot of spaces for artists, for curators, for historians, for writers. Um, and if those people don't exist, then it's also about creating the tools for, for them to emerge and, and to connect to each other. So how we do that is through our residency program where we offer artists studio space, a materials budget and a per diem. Um, as well as resources. So we have a, a resource center that's got a contemporary art library. Um, and simple thing, things that may seem simple, like uh, connection to the internet and a printer and um, Adobe Creative Suite, uh, the kinds of things that help artists to you know, apply for residencies and other opportunities internationally. Um, and then we also have um, resources in, the t in, in, um, in staff as well. So, we have program managers who are able to talk to artists about you know, their portfolio or how do you work on a CV. Um, and also, I think what's really important about our center is that we're a space for creatives to connect to each other. Um, I think if you have visited Kampala, you'll notice that it's, it's a small city, but can feel, um, we were established on Seven Hills originally, and now it's expanded to, I think, 25. And even though it's small, mobility is a really big issue. And so a lot of artists will operate in silos and maybe feel quite disconnected from each other. And so to have a space where artists can meet and you know, talk through some of the issues that they're going through or you know, have facilitate new um, collaborations, um, have peer critique, I think is really essential if you're dealing with an area that doesn't have the kinds of infrastructure or financial support. Um, that other contexts might. Um, so one of the things that is really huge for us in the next few years is we're working on a capital project. So we're trying, to, right now we rent our space and we're in the process of fundraising to build a new center that's completely purpose-built. Um, so <laughs> right now our artists, um, we, we give them studio space and it's shipping containers, which are pretty great, you know, they work for what they need to, but um, when it's 30 degrees um, Celsius, it, it can be, <laughs> you're working in a metal box. So, <laughs> um, so to have purpose-filled space um, that artists can work in and thrive in, um, in, again, a context that, you know, we, we're not on the government's agenda, um, we're not a priority, we're not really, in some ways, we are sort of invisible, which, can lend to some kind of flexibility as well. You're almost able to get away with more. Um, but it also does mean that you have to be incredibly scrappy and resourceful. And yes, you know, we've, um, right now, a lot of our funding comes from Stitch Ding Doon, which is based in the Netherlands, um, and also Mimeta, which is in Norway. Uh, and sometimes British Council will fund some of our programs. So, you know, often people ask us, oh, you have a lot of international donors, how come? But um, they're, they're not really other options. And so, because also in these different contexts where this, this funding comes from, um, you know, ministries of culture and arts and culture budgets are tightening everywhere. And so to have our own space where, you know, regardless, artists will always have physical space to create and to meet, I think, is essential. So that's a really big thing we're working through. Terrific. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into um, to some of these funding sources later. But I wanted to highlight that, because it, it, all, all over the world, you know, we'd all like more, more budget for culture and more government support for culture. But it's it really been extraordinary talking to Tessa to discover that Uganda has no ministry. Um, and so that's one thing I'd highlight. Um, <laughs> But, um, um, but, but yeah, also uh, what, what I found interesting in, 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 the, in the case of Uganda is there is a, a, quite a well-renowned fine arts school, tertiary education. And so, um, so before 32, you know, what, 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 was, what were 
artists coming out of university with their BAs, I mean, what would they, where, where did they go to be with each other, to create, uh, you know, without this kind of center, what, what would Uganda's art scene be? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, so Margaret Trowell School of Fine Arts, which is uh, part of Makerere University, um, is actually quite renowned, and a lot of artists from the have gone through that program. And I think particularly in the 70s and 80s, there was a really amazing crop of artists who um, graduated from the university. Um, but a lot of them also, because of what was happening historically in Uganda, a lot of them had to leave the country or go into, yeah, a lot of them went into exile or sort of went a bit quiet. Um, but, you know, there's still an amazing legacy that they left behind. But as with a lot of universities, I think all over the continent, um, budgets are really tight. And so a lot of artists, <laughs> it's really interesting, a lot of artists will uh, graduate never having met a practicing artist. So they'll maybe enter the university and enter the fine arts department because they didn't get the right grades for law, or medicine, or engineering, and so they're like, oh, I guess art, maybe, you know, that's, maybe it's easy, or, you know, I can draw, I guess I'll do that. Um, and so there's a lot of focus now on technique, but not as much on concept and experimentation, and so 32 emerged as a space to sort of meet that gap, because the university, I think, was um, struggling from being under budgeted, and a lot of professors having to, you know, not being paid for months and having to fund um, their students, you know, if they're sculptors, having to fund material and things like that. So um, I think it's really important to have a space like that because the university has unfortunately, yeah, not made those things. Mahmoud? Morning, everybody. I'm Mahmoud Afe from Mali. The African Culture Fund was born uh, in uh, Seychelles uh, by the African uh, artists and uh, some uh, cultural actors as well, uh, with um, three ends. First of all, we wanted to contribute uh, to the professionalization of, uh, of the African creative sector because uh, uh, as we know, the value chain, the, the weakness of the creative sector is uh, about uh, skill, about competence, and uh, that was very important for us. And uh, secondly, uh, we wanted to 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 be to to be an uh, agitator uh, uh, for uh, investment of uh, private actor and artists. This is the key point. That was the key point for us because uh, uh, to, 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 to encourage uh, African artists and uh, African philanthropy or private sector to put their money in uh, uh, the fund to help uh, their African artists. That was very important for us. And to kind of uh, to engage uh, uh, African uh, to support uh, Africa. That was uh, very interesting. And um, finally, uh, the, the aims also was uh, uh, really want, wanted to, 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 to writing uh, a new narrative uh, um, uh, for social change uh, through uh, innovative projects that uh, we found. That's why we start since one year ago, and uh, we have uh, finished. With, uh, we have launched. We have uh, have uh, we have uh, the first proposal called uh, in, uh, the last uh, October. We for uh, successful with uh, uh, continental audience because we have uh, almost uh, uh, 500 uh, uh, candidates. And that means uh, the need is real uh, in Africa. And uh, we will uh, uh, start with the uh, next uh, call next month. And then uh, I am uh, very glad to be here with my colleague, uh, Georges Camille. Uh, we, we create the fund together. Uh, uh, we launch uh, together uh, in Seychelles. George Camille uh, is uh, among uh, 
the donator, uh, he, uh, the, he gave uh, some uh, painting, and uh, he is uh, also a member of uh, the board, and then he can add something, uh, because uh, I am French, uh, uh, my English is not so very... Uh, you should have made the panel, <laughs> panel by then, right? I know there's many French speakers in the room, so um, so they'll also enjoy talking to you. Okay. And, uh, um, so, um, but but Mabe, uh, I know that you've done um, a first call recently and given some grants. What mm. what kind of projects are you seeking to um, to finance to give grants to, um, and, and who have you so far been able to to finance? Well, uh, uh, we support. Uh, the, 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 the project uh, from uh, committed artists uh, who support uh, who support uh, uh, freedom of expression, uh, who support uh, democracy, who support uh, human rights. Uh, I think uh, and the innovative project because uh, we have some uh, um, uh, key, I can say. Uh, we have uh, set up uh, the jury, international jury from all Africa. The, the one thing is very important for us, it's a continental body. And uh, the, the, the board comes from every region. And uh, we are nine now, the first board. And uh, also the jury from uh, all Africa. And the jury is uh, very independent. And uh, the jury proposed uh, made uh, selection. And uh, it's very important now in Africa uh, to have uh, um, artists uh, with uh, good uh, skills. That's uh, then first we support the project. The project gives a huge impact uh, on uh, professionalization and the, and the, 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 the sector. Because uh, for us, uh, we are here. If we want to be here, we need to improve. Your skill, it's uh, the key point for us because uh, talent is not enough now. Uh, everybody knows there is a lot of creativity in Africa, but uh, it's not enough. We need to improve our skills and to improve and to, 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 to build real capacity because uh, there is a new challenge. And, and, and finally, we, 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 we think deeply. Uh, it's important to engage uh, African artists and uh, uh, private actors because that can give us some sustainability. Because uh, you know we don't want this project uh, only uh, receive the money from the north, and when the money is finished, ah, we need to set up and we need to to make very deep leaks. So that's. That's why this project is very unique. As well, we just start. Start very. It's not very easy because it's about uh, art. It's about Africa. It's about money. But uh, we have uh, confidence uh, to step by step. And uh, we can. Yeah. Brilliant. And I, again, again, we'll we'll talk about um, how you find patrons a, a little later in the discussion. Uh, Bruno, would you like to tell us um, a bit about Hanger uh, and and also the the, the art collection? Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you for waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I have a feeling I took the scenic route to get here. So um, I'm Bruno Vettel, and I am from Lisbon, and I'm one of the directors of uh, Angar Center for Artistic Research, and um, Angar is a non-profit. Uh, speaking about funds to begin with, we get our funding uh, mainly from public contests with the, the local, with the National Arts Council in, in Portugal. We do, we, we do exhibitions, we do residencies, we do, um, we have uh, artist studios because the residents are mainly foreign, so we felt that for the, the building to be alive, we have this uh, artist studio inside the building, so there's this kind of communication. And we have a big, uh, uh, we have a re, um, educational service, but also we have a, um, a 
a research department. And for that, we have the agreements with two research centers, one in Lisbon with the University of Lisbon. It's called the Center for Comparative Studies. They are experts in African culture in Portugal. And with the train, uh, Michael Ashbery is in Paul Goodin uh, that spoke here yesterday uh, with the train in, in London. Um, and this is because when we started on God, we wanted to we wanted to address the history of Lisbon. And of course, if you want to address the history of Lisbon and if you want to think what can a cultural institution do in a certain place, uh, you have to think about the history of uh, three continental history of uh, Lisbon. Um, also, uh, it's a very unique capital in Europe. In, in um, the si uh, 16th century, it had um, over 10% of African population. So it's very special in, in, the, uh, in many ways. And um, we felt that none of the, the cultural art centers re reflected that, even though there were attempts. Um, so this is a little bit uh, Angar, and then um, Last year we started this, um, we didn't start the collection, we, we formed uh, its uh, new way of being, it's called FIS, uh, and it's an Af uh, um, a collection of art dedicated to African art with a specific focus in the first years to Angolan art. Um, and that brings me to this, um, this book that we have here. Actually, this, is, uh, this was done in Angar. Um, we wanted to do something with... Uh, we wanted to address the vitality of Angolan art uh, production. Uh, it's a very uh, vital art scene, and especially uh, its diaspora. In Lisbon, there's a lot of connections, a lot of uh, friends from Angola have their studios in Lisbon, or they have a foothold in Lisbon somehow. So we wanted to, to create a kind of um, a, a survey, not the survey, but a survey around Angolan artists and its diaspora. And uh, we did it uh, with the artists themselves. Uh, I was not the editor. The editor was Monica Miranda. She, she's uh, Angolan. But um, it's 14 artists. Six of them are, are women, and every artist chose either a curator or a researcher to write on their work. I'm, I'm one of the writers. I wrote about Kiwanji Kienda, and I was in the advising committee, but uh, that's about it for my contribution. And we did it with an academic structure. That means that we had a, a scientific committee, uh, a blind... Um, support for the texts during the process. Well, it's, um, I think it's a very interesting book. <laughs> Just wanted to share it with you. Available from all good bookstores, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, this is the first one from Angar. We've done some, uh, some, uh, some uh, um, translations because uh, Portuguese is uh, it's a very small uh, editorial market because we don't share a market, for instance, with Brazil like the Spanish do, they, they share their market with uh, the uh, Latin American sp uh, Spanish part. We don't, so that means that we I went through college and university reading everything in English, French, German, whatever. So we do got a, a lot of translations as well. But this is the first book from scratch done at, um, at Anga. Okay, terrific. Okay, thank you very much. So look, that's, that's us. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd quite like to know who we have in the room, actually, if you don't, if you don't mind doing a little exercise. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, how many people in the room, uh, just put your hand up, you don't have to stand up or, or shout or anything, but, but, uh, but how many people in the room work for uh, non-profit or philanthropic ex uh, initiatives um, overall, I mean, any, anywhere in the world? That's great, lots of people. In, and what about in, in Africa? Fantastic. Okay. And are there, do we have artists in the room? <laughs> I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm choosing these questions so that George has to put his hand up every time. <laughs> um, so uh, that's great. And any curators in the room? 
Fantastic. Uh, any philanthropists in the room? Some shy philanthropists as well. <laughs> uh, so t terrific. Okay, so I think we gotta, we're going to have a great discussion. So we're going to get stuck into the issues um, now, some of the issues that we've brought up. And, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. But, um, I mean, if you have a really burning desire to, to jump in, then, um, then maybe that is a good opportunity to shout. Um, so, so let us know, and we'll pass you a, a microphone. Um, terrific. So, look, I think, I think one of the first things, you know, that I'd like to get stuck into is this question of international funding. Because certainly in a session we had yesterday, there was a sense I felt in the room that international funding versus, um, versus you know, local funding within African states or from Africans to African projects, there was, that there was a, um, a preference, obviously, for the latter, even though, you know, at the moment we're very reliant on the support of, 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 our, of our friends abroad. Um, but so, yeah, uh, we, we have a, a range of different views here, but um, this reliance, first of all, is it, is it a, um, you know, a, a worrying thing that, uh, that art projects and cultural projects uh, are so heavily reliant? And when I say heavily reliant, what we discovered in our research was, for example, you know, almost every public art festival or biennale that I looked at, uh, biennial that I looked at, was extremely reliant on international support. Um, uh, you know, alongside, of course, some local corporate sponsorship or local patrons, but I think probably if you removed Goethe Institute, you know, then, 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 then the, the people would, would struggle. And, and also independent nonprofits, what I've termed independent nonprofits, again, also, you know, scratch the surface, and a, a, lot, of, a lot of funding comes from, um, you know, international foundations or international government agencies. Is this, is, is this a problem? Um, particularly, I'm sure we don't want the, the funding to dry up, so we're not going to tell <laughs> tell them to stop. But I mean, but you know, and and uh, and I guess you know, it, 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 how do we perhaps you know encourage more local patrons? Um, Malik, thank you. Well, well that is uh, um, we, we just start to respond, but since. Um, uh, uh, 18, 18, 18 years ago, I ran a, a festival uh, in the Niger, and uh, I managed the Centrum. Then uh, we used uh, to know that how it's very difficult uh, to be sustainable with the international funding. For as, as well, even um, uh, we are uh, African Cultural Fund, we, 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 we ask money from international funding. But for our concept, first, we wanted to mobilize uh, the resources from Africa. Because uh, there is uh, the context. Sometimes uh, the international funding doesn't uh, really understand the context uh, in my village. And that's just one thing. And uh, if you are very... Uh, uh, you have a good capacity, you can promote yourself, maybe you have uh, lucky to meet uh, some international funding. But uh, if we want to put, uh, the, to, to, to help this uh, uh, African creative sector, uh, sustainability, I think one thing is uh, important to add in international um, uh, funding, to add, to mobilize, because they now, you know, uh, the uh, private sector is very dynamic in Africa, and 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 we we have we was surprised to see because we start with uh, Abdullah Konate who give us one painting from uh, uh, 100, uh, 150,000 uh, uh, euro, you know, the, we have the, the, the and the, the artist uh, who give the work come from all Africa and sometimes beyond Africa. And that's why uh, they have a commitment and if we have a, a good institution, good capacity, uh, it's possible to, to, to mobilize. For us, funding the future is the key must be uh, uh, 
private actor and private sector in Africa. And secondly, the international funding we need all the time, but now it can be we are not so, it's not secure. You know, I, 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 the, the, the George is here. Every year when we start the festival, we look for God, you, are, you get so stressed. Hey, sometimes they can, okay, it's time to stop because uh, you change the politics, the, the policy, you want to go, and then some big, some very good project to end. Yeah. I, mean, that, that's the, I think that's noticeable. That's uh, changing funding priorities in, in maybe by foreign governments, particularly if it's a government agency, or by big foundations themselves, you know, shifting priorities towards gender studies away from culture or something like this, all good things to finance, but it leaves artistic projects vulnerable, certainly. Uh, uh, I can add also, the government doesn't work, generally, in West Africa, uh, because we know the situation of Africa, the government, the, the, their priority is, uh, uh, other side is not, uh, the, first, they don't really understand the power of art, because we know now the, 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 the creative sector is very dynamic, it can uh, give the, the, the job and, and everything. But generally, the government doesn't understand. Then for, for them, the, 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 this sector is not very important. We don't generally, as uh, she said now, uh, we have a ministry in Mali, but uh, uh, you know, uh, its priority is uh, uh, beyond. It's not uh, the, the sector. That's why we need to find. It's it's difficult uh, because it's not very easy because we start uh, six or eight, eight months to discussing with some uh, private uh, actor. It's very difficult because uh, and uh, we try to have some little confident. It is a long way, maybe two, three, four years. But even we have uh, built finish to build a right institution who can mobilize and, uh, and we have and we get confidence for the artists and uh, uh, you know we are here it's uh, African art and the Venice Forum you know it's, it's, if you can help African art uh, in Africa it can be also very good and unfortunately the government doesn't work and uh, you know and then we, we want to work uh, before uh, private sector and uh, international. Let me let me bring Tessa. In. Thank you. Let me bring Tessa. T -t Tessa, Tessa. I mean, how do you go about in Uganda? I know you have a program of of trying to attract local support and patrons. Uh, and and also and also, of course, you know, uh, go ahead with what you I think we're about to say. Also. Um, yeah. So we we've been thinking about that as a lot as an organization, and so we started. Um, the supper club called Palette um, that was a one night only um, silent auction and um, three course meal sort of thinking about you know it's not a question of funds like there's there are a lot of Ugandans who actually can afford art and you know could be interested in it theoretically um, so how do you reach people where they are and based off of their already established interests and Ugandans really like to eat and they really like to drink and so we're like okay let's you know have an event that sort of highlights food but also brings in art um, and affordable art and also encourages you know a new way of seeing things um, by you know having a silent auction encouraging competition that kind of thing um, so it's been quite mixed to be honest um, I think more then bringing in large amounts of funding, it's really been about introducing people to different artists. Because we, we also invite the artists to the event. Um, they're able to speak about their work. It's really quite informal in that they'll be sitting at the table and you know talking to potential patrons. And so that's one thing that we've done um, to try and meet that gap. But I think another thing that I'd wanted to say is that it's not necessarily this um, binary between international and local funding. Um, one thing that's, I think, really important for all organizations um, that are independent or nonprofit is having funders that are um, sort of value aligned or vision aligned to what you're doing. Um, and it's really, that's hard to find international, internationally or locally. Um, I think often, you know, we're reaching out for the same pool of funders internationally, which makes, which 
um, highlights the importance of finding local funding, um, but also, you know, you can find local funding and it can come really tied with a lot of strings as well. Um, and a lot of expectations and a lot of demands that are, you know, maybe based off of this feeling that, you know, they, you, you need us because your culture and culture isn't important, but we're valuing you by saying, you know, here's some money, so be grateful. Sometimes that, that can happen too. And so I think that's really the most important thing when you're, when you're talking about it rather than international local. That's very interesting. So actually having some, some independence from your to run your own program, you know, essentially is, is, is more important than where the money comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tend to agree with many of those factors, uh, factors, at least that it need not be divisional, like A or B, that actually a spread of, of interests is sort of like a healthy way to grow. Um, in our case, for example, with Ford is established at the outset, it, it's seed funded by Wendy and the family deliberately so that we get other supporters in and other voices in to kind of shape what we do and how we do it. And look at that from a range of perspectives. Of course, locally, we need to stimulate money flowing in and people that are active already, as I pointed out earlier, as collectors into the system. So that is, of course, a target pool. But then there, there are others abroad that have the capacity to leverage what's happening at home elsewhere. So it's not just money, it's exchange. And that's key. It's, like we're, it's not a handout. It's a deliberate exchange of values on the one hand, ideas and data of different kinds. So identifying people on networks that have mutually interested, um, invested interests. That way, you 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 you're transacting, not necessarily with um, goods, mm -hmm. but with with insights, with experience, with opportunity to leverage those international networks uh, to expose African, Southern African artworks and processes, and the other way around too. It's like great to have access to international networks that we can learn from existing models, and and test ideas um, against those those platforms. Um, I agree. Of course, my experience is different. We are in, in Lisbon, but what we what we do is uh, we have partnerships with uh, associations in 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 several countries in Africa. So that means that we and there's a bit of a change now because uh, in funding uh, um, we are. Um, for instance, we were just we were just awarded not we but an association that works together with us in Angola called Perschkals. They they were awarded a fund by the Gulbenkian Foundation, which usually wouldn't do something like this. They would award money and funding for institutions in Portugal, and we we did an application a joint application uh, in in which. Basically, the Angolan Association was was uh, heading everything and was um, it, it's a project that is to be done in Angola, so of course they are the most important part of it, and they were awarded uh, that that uh, that money. So I think what you were saying is is what we from from the standpoint of uh, a nonprofit in Lisbon, what we try to do is that kind of exchange. In various forms. Also, we are a part of a, a triangle network, and I'm not sure if Alessio is here. Was here. I think oh, he he escaped. <laughs> <laughs> so through the through the triangle network, we help each other. We stand. Uh, we create this kind of a network, and we try to help each other uh, in that sense. And also, we do a lot of exchange. It benefits it benefits everybody. Um, also next year through Angar, and I managed to convince two other um, associations, in uh, one in France and one in in the in the UK, to to um, again talking about Angola because it's our na natural partner in everything uh, to get uh, Angolan curators to do kind of Erasmus. I think everybody here agrees that the, the best that came out of the UE was Erasmus, against all prejudice and everything. I mean, Portuguese got to meet German, German got to... You got this interchange in Europe, and we're going to replicate that. First, uh, the first part, which is the easiest in terms of funding, is to get somebody out of Angola to come for a month in Lisbon, a month in Paris, and a month in London. But then the second part is with partners in other countries in Africa to create a kind of uh, um, 
a kind of exchange of curators. Because if you want a, a, an art scene to thrive, that's one of the ways. And then, you imp uh, and then you ask them and you get funding for exhibitions in Lisbon or in other places with these young curators. Sometimes they are even not trained as curators. Uh, not everybody has the money to go to goldsmiths or something like that. But they are artists working as curators. And we're very interested in, in doing that. So, yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's it's sort of outside of the context, but I think interesting was a discussion last night around uh, a project in London some years ago called How to Work Together, which was the showroom Chisinau and Studio Voltaire, who recognized that they were similarly sized not-profits. Um, they ran similar but not necessarily overlapping programs, and they were looking at opportunities to kind of leverage what each other was doing. Perhaps you have a resident, we can do a show, whatever the case is. And that, that was the kind of gene of how to work together, but found after some time that because of how hyperlocal it was in a way, that they, they were actually seeking similar funding streams, and it inhibited their capacity to share ideas in that framework. So in fact, there they could very well be limits to organizations seeking within hyperlocal pools, and in fact, extending those networks allows a degree of agency, not only from the organization point of view, but within partnerships, and to potentially be able to share better. Yeah, no, I, can. I find that, I think that's really interesting. I think it's a very nuanced discussion on, on this subject, um, actually. So, European funding, not a bad thing. <laughs> also, there's a pragmatism that I think yeah. also should be yeah. counted in. The yeah. currency exchange yeah. is significant, you yeah. know, and yeah. what we can do with that money is extraordinary, and it's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah terrific. Um, you know, and, uh, but, but at the same time, you know, attempts to stimulate local patronage go on. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in um, you know, perhaps why that's taken longer to take off. And, and I think, as I say, you know, what's been really encouraging in the research that we've done is noticing that that landscape is changing very quickly. Um, you know, and the number of private projects and private initiatives that have taken off in the last five years um, you know, has grown exponentially and is now driving most of the nonprofit sector, actually. Um, and, uh, and also particularly driven by artist-led projects. It's very interesting to see what, what artists themselves think um, that they need and that their peers need. Um, and a lot, and I was just picking up on, on the idea of scholarships. You know, a lot of, it's a lot, seems to be a lot about residency programs. It seems to be a lot about um, project spaces, it seems, and, and, and those kind of opportunities to travel, to meet one another, to work together, um, which, uh, yeah, was, was interesting, I think. Um, why, why do you think um, it is also, you know, the, 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 here we are in the heart of the contemporary art, oldest contemporary art festival in the world, um, and so we're sort of preaching to the converted in terms of of, of the, the requirement for financing of, of culture, whether it be from uh, public or from private sources. Um, but certainly in the, some of the countries that we're, we're discussing, um, resources are scarce. Uh, financial resources are scarce. There are pressing needs in housing, there are pressing needs in education, there are pressing needs in health. You know, how can we justify part of that budget, as I say, whether from private or public sources, being diverted towards contemporary art um, or the arts in, in general? <laughs> You're ready. You're ready. No, 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 but I'm talking all the time. Go for it. I have loads of ideas. <laughs> um, sorry, let me, let me repeat. So, um, in, but my, my question, sorry, in, in, my less, in a less long winded way. Um, uh, yeah, I think well maybe Baraka can uh, can help. So my question, uh, Mamu, was was in countries with scarce financial resources, um, where there are needs uh, for education, there are needs for health, there are needs for housing. Um, how do we justify uh, public money or or private philanthropy being diverted towards um, culture? but particularly, perhaps since we're sitting here, contemporary art. Uh, the, the first sort of general point is, at least from my side, is that they're not mutually exclusive, that they're interconnected. 
that um, it's, it's quite easy to see the arts as separate from education or from housing concerns when it's centered around an object that's bought and sold and traded as an asset. Mm -hmm. But when you backpedal from that and you negotiate it as a process, as a lived, lived experience, when that's embedded in research processes and sharing, then it is in fact an educational process depending on how it's shared and negotiated. So, for example, in, in our case, we're curious about these questions, right? We're curious about what the impact is, how we can understand it beyond bums on seats or feats and doors. Um, and one of the ways we look at doing that is extracting the process of art and injecting it into um, other disciplinary encounters. In, in our case, there are two ongoing experiments. Well, one ongoing in sort of a range of different ways and one new. One is with urban planners, others with medical students. And what we're seeing is that we're introducing, again, not artworks, but artistic processes into study programs that are centered around things that would otherwise be considered completely and utterly different. Urban planners consider how it is we live together, what the barriers to entry are, what a just or unjust space could, or could be, should be. Um, and artists are catalyzing new ways of thinking about what they do and bringing to bear things that were invisible or unrecognized, challenging their practices and ultimately we hope, or they think, we hope they think because they're returning, helping them think differently about what they do in effective ways. So I think that the, the first step there is trying to understand how art integrates into the various strations of society rather than perceived as a, a thing that's divorced from it. And, and again, as soon as you remove the object and its transactional capacity and you negotiate it as a process, it becomes not only viable but very alive. So people are thinking differently, they're innovating. How can that innovation challenge all forms of, of society, it's specifically where it's urgent? Housing, education, medical, and other. Um, yeah, I'm sneaking in before other people say really brilliant things and have nothing else to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in part, sometimes, yeah, I guess it's one way of looking at it, but a lot of those really urgent needs and pressing needs are because there's always been this sense of diversion and valuing one thing over the other. And, you know, I think we're all at a sense or a place where we recognize that the way the world is right now doesn't work. And um, often it's because we've valued particular things over others and um, pulled a lot of resources into those things that we, I don't know who the we, <laughs> I guess the, you know, power structures value, right? Um, so, you know, this is a question that isn't really often directed at, let's say, wealth management or, you know, um, energy, so energy, I don't know, <laughs> but I think I, it, is interesting that that's, that question is often addressed to culture um, without noting the fact that you know we're we're in an area, uh, a place in time where um, how how we uh, allocate our resources and our values is is failing us, right? So um, I think that would be my question back to that. You know, art is the solution. The culture is the solution for, for the Africa, mm -hmm. definitely. Because art is about imaginary. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the government, the people, uh, the, the artists uh, help people and transport people through its imaginary. It's very important. That's why uh, uh, we have uh, two things. Uh, so, uh, first, it's about uh, social development. That means the government must, priority, must make the priority, the priority to invest to the art and culture because art and culture is about education, it's about uh, social change, it's about uh, imaginary, and it's about uh, thinking new for Africa. Then, then it can give us the hope for the future. That's why the culture and art is a very, very uh, key point for, for, for this, this moment. And the second thing is, I don't know, you, you, you must know because you, you, you make the analysis about uh, uh, economy of the culture. You know now uh, the, the economy of culture is very huge and important. The, the, the economy of creativity is very important. I have a friend in Mali, in the village, who can sell one painting, uh, 100,000 euros. Sometimes 100 in the village. 
let's open our mind. That can, if the, the art is very strong, can be changed the life. And this artist, uh, you know, there, there is, I think we try to understand quite well in Africa. Uh, first, there is all the time the, the creativity and artistic, but now we try to structure and uh, to put in the market and can be help uh, government for the balance because they provide, they, they can pay the impo, the tax, don't, if they understand quite well and they analyze the situation and they put the money on the sector, maybe not one year or two, it's a long time, but we can definitely make a significant progress with uh, R, I think. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think we, we, we're, we're beginning to run out of time, so, so I'd like to throw open some questions. Um, oh, have we got enough time? Thank you. Um, I'm Firo Zadak from the uh, Rothschild uh, Foundation, so we fall in the category of uh, philanthropist. So I just want to make quickly three points. Uh, thank you. It was very uh, inspiring and thought-provoking what you each said. But first of all, I'm going to challenge, if I may say, Damien, the way you framed um, the, uh, this panel, because you, on one hand, you talk about African philanthropy, but on the other, if I look at the synopsis, you talk about non-profits, you talk about hybrid, and that's, I think, um, uh, um, something that one has a danger that you have to be watchful of, especially when you do research, because these are very different animals. Uh, by definition, hybrid structures can have a for-profit dimension. Non-profits are depending on people like us, partly, and philanthropists, you know, gave money. The second point is that, um, uh, what I hear here is that you know, philanthropy is first and foremost about money, but not only. Uh, so it's important also that all of you keep in mind the fact that when you deal with people like us, we're not in the business of just writing checks. And uh, Wendy, whom I know well, has been actively engaged in not only providing financial support, but also thoughts. And those thoughts come from uh, linking to my second point, uh, which you all seem to lack, is how Philanthropists like us from the West are actively seeking local agents. And when we talk about local agents, we don't necessarily talk about NGOs. We talk about local philanthropists. So our experience having dealt with philanthropists from Nigeria, Morocco, Kenya, South Africa, the list goes on, is that these people, I agree with you, in Uganda or elsewhere, have money. It's not anymore Africa that is begging for money. Africa has money, has accumulated incredible wealth over the last... 20 years. Uh, however, the, the question is valid. Uh, when they deal with so many needs on the ground, health, education, gender, environment, and so on, culture, with a big C, tends to fall on the side. And they tell us, you know, you guys are from the West. You've got the luxury of having a, a welfare state and so on. We don't. And so our engagement needs to go to our people and caring for the immediate need. Uh, now, my response to that is to say, and I'm going to Josh, is to say, yes, but first of all, you know, in the history of Europe or the U.S., a country which doesn't have culture lacks its soul, and I agree with you, culture is essential. But more and more people like yourselves have to think, and I think that's Josh, what Josh has been trying to do in South Africa, is trying to really provide that link between art, for the sake of art, and social impact. And that requires thinking, and this is how philanthropists come into play, because they can work with you on saying, listen, yes, some people are just going to be patrons, but more and more philanthropy is becoming demanding, it's becoming about impact. And it's not about putting our name somewhere and say, yes, we are patrons. It's really about, okay, so what type of impact can we really demonstrate? So, uh, and, and unfortunately, I find that in the world of arts that we are active in, this dimension, this education, is still missing, And but I... I guarantee that your local philanthropists are also now um, looking at that. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the, those comments, actually. And I think, I think where that discussion was probably ab about to lead to an, to an extent was what, what you're talking about. The return on, what I consider kind of return on philanthropy is, um, is, is an essential component. And we've discussed that 
before in terms of, again, in terms of impact, in terms of, okay, if we're going to have a project. Um, yeah. You just raised something for us that I just want to point to that I'm very curious about and interested in, which is the definition of practitioner. Because there, there tends to be a framework, as we pointed out, where there's like the receiver and the giver. And if we define practitioner as artist, curator, educator, collector, patron, then we're all in it together trying to figure out what resources we respectively have and how to optimize those resources. Sometimes it comes in the form of money, sometimes it comes in the form of network, sometimes it comes in the form of experience, insight, and otherwise. And that's that like opportunity for exchange, which is meeting legitimately with two parties, one organization, some potential co uh, collaborator can go, right, this is what we need, this is what you need, Let's try and identify those things and let's do that together. So the prospect of, of collecting as practice, which we pointed to earlier, and also philanthropy as practice, I think is really curious and deserves more attention because therein one gets to understand what motivates an individual to, to participate and what they can offer. Because in some cases it could be, when we do this at home, we say, well, do you have property? If so, that would be a great space for an artist. Are you a financial expert? Artists have irregular flows of income and they have no idea how to manage it. Um, and the list goes on. So I think that there is a huge opportunity to look at philanthropy as practice, as practitioner, equatable all the way down the chain to artist. And then potentially there's this mutual exchange that is like potentially sustainable or more sustainable. We use the word uh, co-development. So Say again? So we use the word co-development. Ah. Uh, so it's all about co. Uh, and, and in many ways, in the jargon, for instance, Many of you use the word partnership. From a funding perspective, especially in the US, no offense to the Americans, funding means money. So a partnership means money. We believe that our partnership has to be something else. So, hi, uh, my, name is, um, my name is Chiara, and I, I spoke yesterday too, so I don't want to bother you too much uh, today too, but um, together with a few people, I um, first of all, I'm supporting and I'm a member of the art, um, African Art Dialogue that is creating the platform that gives the chance of the forum to happen. But also, uh, together with um, other people that unfortunately are not present today, we created what is called the um, Art Fund for Representation and Inclusiveness of Contemporary African Art, which is Africa, with UA at the bottom. So what we do, we are a for-profit, it's not a non-profit. The fund is raising money in order to purchase a large exhibition space in Venice to create 54 pavilions for countries that are not represented. The core is uh, African countries and then there is going to be transnational projects. So this is um, a based on social impact investing People that gives us funds do not think about having like large returns, 2% and 2.5% on long-term investment is what they eye to. And the content is based on a lot of partnership from institutional investors. We have BlackRock selling you know, shares. And what we want to do, which is what why people give us trust in their funds, is because we aim for supporting art and supporting inclusiveness. In a world that wants to be truly global, what we need is to be all in it, not just some people are in it and not someone else. And this is gonna be bridging culture, avoiding misunderstanding, creating connection, and this is what we should all aim for in order to avoid that. By not understanding each other, there is more conflict. I strongly believe in that, I, I aim for it, I, I, I'm a finance specialist and a lawyer, but I believe in the meaning of it, and this is how I am vacuuming the meaning to people that actually are willing to put money in that. But I, I embrace what the, you know, what has been said from the room. Partnership is not just about, you know, donation. It's about the meaning, the impact you make. Uh, Rick, any more questions, statements, comments? We're done? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say since we, we're out of time. But thank you very much. That's a conversation that well, I'm going to be having for the next uh, six months. And I hope to engage with as many of you as possible during that process. Um, terrific. Thank you very much to our panelists. That was really very nice to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs>